Good morning and welcome from all around the world to Structural Heart Life Cases, broadcasting from the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory from the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. I am Dr. Pedro Moreno, Professor of Medicine and Director of Structural and Interventional Cardiology at Mount Sinai St. Luke's here in New York. The video of this broadcast will be available on the website later today. The last broadcast from May 14 and all our previous structural heart cases are available now at www.cccliveCases.org. We love to hear from you, so please send us all your questions right from the website. We have a great case for you today, and let me take you to the cath lab at Mount Sinai Hospital for the live case. All right. Good morning to our structural heart webcast viewers and uh, this is a little off the cycle usually we uh, are on the first uh, tuesday of every other month uh, but uh, for some logistic reasons we are starting today but uh, also we are done uh, quite a bit of uh, mitral and aortic and uh, tmvr uh, and a valve and valves we thought the let's change something and this time we're doing alcohol septal ablation. We did first actually in our episode number eight. And today is the episode number 30 of the structural webcast. And with, the, with that note, I welcome all uh, with my associate here, Dr. Keeney, and my fellow, Dr. Beamer. And uh, on the ECHO, we have our director of ECHO, um, Dr. Uh, Laurie Kraft. So with that note, knowing that the ECHO is a very important part of this uh, case, uh, we quickly let me just present the slide and then we go to the uh, meat of the matter. That is the echocardiogram and the LV tracing in this particular case with the HOCM. Uh, that is what we want to demonstrate today. Therefore, can we go to the slide, please? Okay, so these are our supporters. No different di disclosure. Um, so this is a 64-year-old morbidly obese female with a known HOCM presented with progressive adjustment dyspnea and fatigue. And patient is on, tried on multiple medical therapy and continues to, remain, to be symptomatic despite calcium blocker, metaprolol, diisopyramide, and so. So now the echo basically showed the septal thickness of 21 and the mid cavity, not truly the, the ideal, the basal, but mid cavity obstruction with a high resting and provocable gradient with hyperdynamic LV. Patient also has a severe MAC with some mitral gradient of about 8 to 10. So, uh, Laurie, you want to just show live? Uh, actually, that will be better. Okay. Can we show the echo? Yeah. Live echo. Big bulge. Yeah, so actually, yeah. to me, it looks like a typical sub aortic bulge. Yeah. Why are we saying mid cavity? I mean, there was so red. Yeah. So see how quite hyperdynamic she is? So she does have a mid cavity, but most of her problems occur down at the basal septum. Okay. And what's the gradient you're getting? So I'm Lauren? getting a resting of 50 and post PVC anywhere between 80 and 95. Okay, now show the hemodynamics for us. You were ready with the Good. definitive mixture also. Show yeah. the echo also, yeah. same time, yeah. not the yeah. floor. Do the echo. PVC. No, do the PVC now. No, no, I know. I want okay. the echo same time. I see. Okay. I need the echo, not the fluoro. Good. Yeah, good. So this is, uh, you, if you can see, we are at the almost uh, mid cavitary to apex. And I'm going, just going to give a post PVC here. Yes, post PVC. Look at the gradient. Wow. Almost uh, 200. Very remarkable. Uh, Pedro, right? There's yeah, classical broken board sign, sign with the increase of the systolic uh, pressure up to 200 plus and decrease of the aortic pressure to 100. So certainly LVOT obstruction unquestionably. And uh, dagger shaped, uh, you know. Dagger shape on echo. echo. Beautiful dagger shape on echo. Good. No MR, uh, Lori, no, on no, your it Doppler? There's a lot of, uh, there's, um, here's the color. The problem is there's an inflow obstruction from the very significant mitral annular calcification. Mm -hmm. So we have at least mild, maybe mild to moderate MR, but as you can see here, if we Doppler through this. this Actually, it has been read as a mild to moderate MR yeah. by every test, mm -hmm. including the earlier echo as well as even um, cardiac MRI. Yeah. Right, so, so mild to moderate MR and significant mitral inflow obstruction. 
So this is exactly the perfect case because this MR will actually decrease with the septal ablation. As soon as we remove the Venturi effect, mm -hmm. that MR will be probably traced to none. Okay. So let's, uh, this is the coronary angiogram now. We can go to coronary angiography if you see there. So essentially what you need to see is most of these patients don't have underlying coronary artery disease. Um, and uh, similarly in this case, if you see the angiogram, now go back to left uh, angio. This is non-obstructive coronary disease. So there are uh, two septals that we can see, not the echo, angio. Now what we can do is put an echo on the top, you don't have to show our face, and bring the angio on the right side. Echo continues, yeah. but to put echo the angio. Left. Yeah. Echo on the left upper and the angio on the right side. Good, beautiful. Okay, now question is large septals. Yeah, so if you mm -hmm. see that's one large septal, that's the second septal. There is one small septal, which is the first septal, branching, but it does not reach all the way down to the septum. So what I would like to do is go to the second septal, and in the second septal, it's branching. So you go to the first branch all the way down, that is likely going to reach the um, you know, basal thick septum that we are uh, focusing on. Same thing, I think if you see the large septal itself is a 2 millimeter, but when we go down, it will be 1.5. So we'll, you'll take a 1.5 millimeter over the wire balloon, um, which is uh, a 1.5 millimeter diameter, and the length is about 8 millimeter. That is what we are going to use. And then the alcohol will be the, usually we say 100%, but uh, it is 98% uh, ethanol that we get here. Uh, that's uh, absolute alcohol that we have everything ready. So the pacemaker, you always leave a pacemaker through the RIJ. Um, this is a tempo lead, which is a new lead that we are using for all our structural uh, tower cases. Uh, since it's going to be uh, left in place for 48 hours, we are going to uh, uh, leave this RIJ temporary wire. So the need for the pacemaker uh, for the septal ablation is about 10% or so, but the way you can uh, decide whether the patient will need or no is uh, same underlying uh, EKG changes, which is which is already has uh, underlying left bundle branch block, interventricular conduction defect, first degree AV block, or any of this uh, defect. If they have likelihood of needing a pacemaker is larger. But what more important is what is procedurally we can change that you inject alcohol slowly, uh, not fast slow. You start the timer. You take your time, almost up to two minutes to inject even one cc of alcohol, no more than uh, two cc at a time in a given septal. Uh, the echo, I mean, Lori will, uh, first, as soon as we go there, we will give some uh, definity and decide that is exactly the part of the septum that we want to inject, and then we'll inject the alcohol. But the key, I think, here is the planning, which is the septum that you need to inject, uh, and, uh, you know, so sometimes what we do, we call is surfing the septal. We have to go to multiple septals and then decide which is the right septal to inject. Once we find the right septal, then we just inject and then wait a few minutes. You'll see the instantaneous decrease in the gradient. Okay. So, Good. Dr. Good. Kinney, your, your decision-making regarding the size of the vent of the septum, what would you think would be appropriate and when do you get concerned for this uh, procedure? Talking I about mean, the, the size uh, it of the has vent. to be, uh, so we, we are talking about it has to be more than 16, but anything less than 30 millimeter, uh, we do it, anything of more than 30, that is, I think, the true genetic uh, young age, uh, HOCM, where it is all uh, concentric. Those are the kind of patients who definitely will benefit from myectomy. Others, everybody should get uh, the first try of septal ablation. Very good. You have it? Yeah. Uh, good. Okay, we are ready now. We have 1.5 balloon, and idea would be go but, to the uh, major the key, steps on uh, the right key side. is also not that uh, thickness, also the how thin, you know, it cannot be the normal, you know. 14 millimeter is upper limit of normal, uh, so I would say 16. So just make sure we have some septum before you can decide you want to inject. Yeah, rare cases up to, I would say, maybe 13, but the minimum you have to have uh, the between 14 to 20, uh, no, this is that, 25, uh, 26. First septal, yeah. that mm -hmm. which we, is very small. You want to go here and see? No, 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 we go to the... Yeah. 
the bulge we one. could try we happen, hold on no yesterday no? we did the same the the one which is compressing it the bifurcating septal the right one that's where you need to go we did a case yesterday exactly we thought we go to the first one but the one which was getting compressed uh, first one we did alcohol last night didn't okay, make any difference die? Are but we then we went to the second, second where which was being compressed systolically mm -hmm. that's the one yeah so yeah you expect yeah. you expect some type of competitive flow sometimes from the obstruction of the ventricle yeah. like a milking effect of the yeah. actual septum by angiography mm, although that's I may, a i'm concerned sign. the way it's going that distal we may be getting into the rv here anyway let's see you're more saline in this okay we have the definitely one second you're ready with the definitely guys where this one okay so basically what we need to do now no no first let's go up So once you are with the balloon, inflate the balloon to about seven, eight atmosphere. So you are making sure are you too far occluded. Or not? No, no, I am too far. That's the way I want it. Huh? That's you the way we want it. Yeah. So you're just causing small good. Okay. And since you'll be injecting, so we take the wire out under the water. So there's no suction of air into the. Even though it's very small balloon, you don't want any air being sucked. Can they show from the top camera how we are doing this? Do we have the top camera? Tell him to look at this. Okay, I'm uh, injecting uh, definitely. Can you see that? We I need mean, the camera. Yeah, yep, dead. Yeah, good. But we now need we need echo. everything. We need everything. Uh, yeah. Back. So we see the like we were before. Range. No, no, but we need the echo, the hemodynamics. We need more of echo now, yeah. Good. And hemodynamics. So the balloon is there. Close. Can he add that extra window to show us the... No, but that's okay. Now, since you showed the hand earlier, good. Okay. Floro? So no here. need to floro. Okay, I think we are at the right septum. Right part where? Can you see the echo? Yep. So, so you see the definity contrast coming into the basal septum. It's actually excellent position to try to start here. Okay. So we got a green light from uh, Lori. So will give us uh, alcohol. Three cc's. So you have three? Work, you fill no. up the three in the syringe. You don't give all give three. Give me. No, not give me. Not three. you have another. Three. Okay. Three. Okay. I usually take two. Yes. Start the timer, Pablo. Yes. You, so whichever you have. How much? It is a five in the syringe? So you three cc. Just keep on your hands, love. Five, okay. Yeah. Okay, just one second. Just gotcha, five. Good. So two cc's we have right now. Yeah. And we always do the smell test, make sure it is alcohol. <laughs> Okay, now you're connected. Water to water fluid, 2 cc. We started the timer, slow injection. Okay, now give some morphine. Patient will start having chest pain. And uh, time to time, you need to just give some dye, make sure LED is okay, that there's no overflow. Can you take a cine? Just make sure we are, because we never documented. Inject. See the, you can see the dot, the balloon? Mm hmm Okay, now I think I want to move the multipurpose. So, see, she's moving, having pain. And look like multipurpose has come back. Yeah. We try to go back to the apex again. You want to again. do that? Yeah. I want to keep giving here. So, it is important to notice that very little alcohol can do a lot of good work here. The surgeons classically remove three to five grams of muscle. They... This is like any That's other right. LVOT obstruction that very minimal changes in diameters can make significant changes in the hemodynamics. So as Dr. Kinney has explained meticulously, just a little bit, one to two cc of alcohol may be enough. We're expecting about 800 CPK total and probably between 50 to 60 MB fraction. 
the reduction of the gradient is triphasic. So we have initially stunning of the myocardium that will eliminate or reduce the gradient dramatically. In three months, the stunning will recover, and there will be initial regain of the gradient that is going to disappear in the next uh, few weeks after remodeling of the ventricle. So keep in mind with the echo, sequential echoes, you can have a little bit of recurrence of the gradient that's expected physiologically as we will have remodeling, and then the, the, uh, the gradient will basically go to 20 or less. A very effective procedure, long-term survival here has been just published in December 2018, up to 15 years. Long-term survival is over 80 to 90 percent, and event-free survival from cardiac events is over 95 percent. So extremely safe, out of 950 cases, only four with sudden cardiac death. This has changed dramatically the indications of this procedure when compared to myomectomy. Yeah. Absolutely. So other thing is, uh, you see that uh, uh, the gradient is going down, but more important, you start seeing some EKG, STT changes. I'm not going to inject more. I've given 1.5 cc, and uh, Lori, I think you see the septum yes. is almost uh, akinetic now. See, it's not moving. Yeah, it's not moving. So even I think it's an indication uh, that uh, gradient has gone down. When you start seeing EKG changes, don't keep injecting more. And you see the PVC also. Yeah. So with the PVC, you saw Beautiful. that 200 uh, gradient. Now we have, uh, barely have any gradient. Abolished. What are there you seeing on the abolished. echo? Um, I'm seeing no gradient at this okay, point. Okay, she's also getting no gradient. You see the nice PVC by itself and no... And the uh, aortic pressure is exactly the same. So no broken board sign. Completely elimination of the LVOT obstruction. Yeah, see now with the post PVC? Yep. Huh? Yeah. Very good. So I gave 1.5 cc. If you can uh, see my uh, finger, 1.5 cc. Yeah, that's it. Very slow injection. So we are three mi uh, three minute, uh, 19 seconds. So this is the crucial point. I think if anybody out there want to start doing this procedure, it is simple. But I think meticulous planning, but slow injection. When you give uh, one cc, if you start seeing some EKG changes, then it's uh, telling us stop. So the need for the pacemaker will be very low with these steps that uh, low, low in, uh, amount has to be less and slow injection. Look at that. I'm not getting any gradient. Beautiful. No gradient. Yeah. Let's look at the MR. Low. Did it change a little bit? MR I'm a little, a little cons um, may not be a lot no, different. I think maybe mild. Hmm. It's very difficult, once again, because of the significant mitral annular yeah, classification. Because she, she has uh, two pathologies. It's a calcific uh, mitral annulus. But her gradient is not there anymore. But just uh, such a small um, necrosis cause in that uh, bulge septum, and that is where the echo guidance comes in. So you just I need to inject there, which is the bulge portion, and then look at the dramatic um, outcome results right away. So uh, other thing uh, what we need to do is many times, this is the f uh, we got the septal first time. Many, uh, it takes sometimes 10 to 15 minutes sometimes to find the right septal. So very important to know where are the septals coming from. Of course, is the septal coming from the LED. There are septals we have injected from the diagonal. There are septals that are coming out from the ramus we have injected. There are septals that are coming out of the left vein we have injected. And it's a rare situation which we actually published the septal, aberrant septal that's coming from the right coronary artery, which also we have injected. So all these septals you need to know. So you need to have some patience to find the right septal, not just go to the first septal, inject and come out. You got to find the right septal with the help of the echocardiographer. You then uh, select that this is the, not maybe the septal, but in the branch of the septal. So you have to go to these smaller branches then when you inject the definity, you know this is the part of the myocardium, which is the basal septum, okay? Basal septum, not the mid-cavitary or anything. And sometimes what you see, the first septal, when you're injecting, can even go to the RV side of the septum. You can, should not be injecting that part. So the risk of VSD is high if you do that. So this is what I'm saying is the key thing is knowing where all the septals are coming, going to the right branch of the septal, injecting, and once you have identified that that is the part uh, through the uh, echo, then it's very simple, just inject one, you know, between one to two cc is good, but rare cases we have injected a second and third septal because the gradient just don't go down. 
um, because of, you may have multiple septals supplying that area. Very good. So, yeah. Dr. Sharma, there are yeah. some institutions around the world that still uh, consider myomectomy as an option in these cases. Actually, the guidelines from 2011 put it yeah. as the first uh, operation. And then secondly, for patients not suitable, then the alcohol septal ablation. Yeah. What are your comments yeah. on these? Yeah. So, now I think that is a part of that we'll uh, cover in our discussion that uh, myomectomy still remains, particularly for the elderly patients. I mean, clearly, the... A young person, myomectomy, if you wanted a dichotomy, older patient, uh, uh, septal ablation as an initial therapy. Now, floor, do we want to take just a quick picture of the ventricle? The, now the Alex. pacemaker dependent. Oh. Yep. Uh, let's see the LAD, good flow. Yeah. You deflated now, and uh, we wait a few minutes uh, for the alcohol to wash out. So what happened is I was injecting the saline to get the alcohol of the balloon come out. I think now she's gone into some kind of a block. Yeah. Little that. See? And the pain Just also. Little so make sure little give enough pain. Uh, pain medicines. Oh, you've injected. Oh, he took it. You want to inject the LV? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, okay. Good. Good. <laughs> That's a what? small dose, yeah. Okay. So technically, Dr. Kinney, you were washing out the alcohol with saline. Yeah, then, so that uh, you should not take the balloon, deflate and take it out. Because if you have alcohol in the balloon, when you're trying to come out of the LED and left vein, you, that little, uh, you know, micro millimoles of alcohol could go down the other part of the uh, LED or left main. So you want to make sure whatever is remaining in the balloon, you take it out by flushing it down with the saline. But I think that even, uh, I would say, micro millimole of alcohol uh, has put her into complete heart block now. Yeah, because if you think Go down the alcohol... Go with the patient, on, right? Sure. Yeah. I'm at 50 right now. We are trying to see now by decreasing the pacemaker rate, if anything will happen. So now we are 8 minutes, 30 seconds into inflation. Okay, uh -huh. And what you normally see is when I take out the balloon, uh, you'll see that part of the septal gone. And uh, yeah, see that? You yeah, develop the heart block right now. Yeah. 2 to 1. Okay, go back. 80 pacer. I'm going back to uh, 60. We can take the route, take a picture, and then see. Yeah. <clears throat> 160 right now. Now, this could be, uh, what will happen is also, do you, if you see this kind of uh, rhythm changes, uh, then the need for pacemaker is half and half, but it could be the edema that we have created right now by injecting alcohol. By tomorrow, if, uh, so 48 hours is a must, that this temporary pacemaker has to be in the body and she's monitored in the ICU for 48 hours. Uh, then... After that, we can decide. Uh, by tomorrow, you know, the need for pacemaker means she may get her rhythm back when the edema has subsided. Um, and then we can decide. But 48 hours is a, is a must. 48 hours means to the dot. Like now, it's 10 uh, a.m. here. So it will be Thursday morning, 10 a.m. That's the time we'll decide. Do we take out the pacemaker or no? Temporary wire. Yeah, it is if she needs a permanent pacemaker, she'll get it Thursday now. Yeah. It is it is interesting that the actual data, most recent data, which is 10%, as you mentioned, Dr. Kinney, yeah. is actually very similar to the myomectomy need for pacemaker, which is 9.8% in, in, in the surgical. And so you, you will expect that surgery will be less, and it's actually not, not, that, not, that, not the case. Yeah, this so is only one report, but overall, I would say still, uh, the pacemaker after myomectomy is are, are in tune of 4 to 5%, but yeah. Recent, uh, the, this uh, German report showed around 9.5 and around 10 with the uh, septal ablation. So that's a little unusual, but I think overall, uh, the, we actually have seen uh, with the myomectomy, the pacemaker rate is just about half. Yeah. But it's still there. Good. Okay, let's take it out, take a picture, and see that septal is gone. So now while taking out the balloon, uh, you don't need to wire or anything, I'll just take it out. Yes. Good. Take a picture Let's take a picture of the LED. Hold this. Mm. It does not fly. Good. 
okay you see that uh, septal there's a competitive flow which means that part of the septum uh, i mean the, the uh, branch of the septal yep. yeah the first branch yeah that's what you see you see that is a cut off you will not uh, uh, with the, truly that we edema in that uh, part of the mm -hmm. septum now mm -hmm. and usually you see a cut off little diastasis we haven't seen that because that, i think we just went to a very small branch despite that she has developed uh, you know conduction low max I want a very low mag. Just to make sure everything is good. Let's do AP. Oh, <laughs> yeah. it's pediatric mode. Good. Yeah. AP, you want? Yeah, just AP. Just AP. Yep. The last this picture to make sure that there is no uh, dye spilling anywhere outside the vascular structures. Okay. Yep. Looks good. Good distal Actually, blood flow in the lima. I mean, in the LED. LED has a good flow. Let's see it again. Your competitive flow is interesting. That is, the edema is extending into the other septals uh, uh, area, yeah. which um, give you this to and fro image in the angiogram. Right. You want to try the pacer again? Yeah. No, but that's okay. It will take some time. Yes. I no, won't no, sometimes, you know, we'll see. I'm go down. Yeah. Little go. So you are 80? Okay, leave it. Yeah, yeah, leave it at 40 there. Am I going to 30? No, no, no. So she's 40 now. No, that's her own rate then. Yeah. Decrease the amplitude. No, no, but the amplitude of your uh, ECG. Of ECG is like huge. Yeah. And you just first degree AB block right now. Yeah, right now it's only first degree AB block. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll leave the pacer and uh, like I said, it has come back. It's probably the edema that we created. But uh, look at the echo now. 1.5 cc alcohol and that part of the septum is uh, totally akinetic. And uh, look at this. This is our uh, EKG is back to baseline. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's this ma massive stunning of the septum yeah. right now. Yes, yes. By histology, you confirm necrosis only when there is no nuclei. It takes some time to develop. But and she's not beautiful. getting any gradient. Yeah. So no, beautiful. no. This I think is a good demonstration that what are the, um, you know, EK, the, you saw the EKG changes. Sometimes you may rarely get arrhythmia. We have seen episodes of uh, short runs of VT, non uh, non sustained VTs, and also, uh, uh, you know, sustained VTs where we had to shock patients. But that is just. You know what I say, part of life when you're doing the procedure, and you know that is part, and uh, usually they recover. Actually, like we showed here. We only one death. Uh, we started the program uh, in 2001, and uh, one death we had in 2005 or six. Uh, the patient uh, was a liver cirrhosis patient. Septal thickness was 29 millimeter, and the patient after the septal ablation gradient obliterated but went into ventricular storm multiple shocks amiodron lidocaine uh, and then 24 hours later the patient uh, we lost him but that was the case so we made that uh, cut off that your 26 to 28 millimeters should be up upper limit uh, of uh, the septal thickness because then you're just causing so much necrosis but that was also early stages now probably the same patient will be able to go very subselective in a very small branch may not cause that, that ventricular stop. But key is that your septal thickness is one of the factors. One cannot be too thin, cannot be too thick for alcohol septal ablation. Guidelines are 30 millimeter, I mean, uh, three centimeters. Yep, I mean, yeah, so there are like uh, some of them 28, some uh, so between, I would say 15 to 28 will be the good one. But yes, 30 is the usual guidelines. Yeah, so with that note, yeah. Mm. Yeah, this was uh, nicely illustrated by the publication of Dr. Kinney in Clinical and Outcomes Innovation Report in 2016 from the Mount Sinai Hospital, how the thickness is, is key to define the actual uh, perfect um, case selection, which was what we've seen today. Fantastic case selection with outstanding results. Okay, with that note, uh, we can quickly go over uh, some of our slide presentations, uh, which we always do supplement uh, the procedure uh, with uh, the didactic discussion and pro provide the latest uh, uh, data. I'm coming back. So key was 
this patient oh, actually, you know, we do MRI routinely because studies have shown that uh, so patients with high uh, myocardial uh-huh. necrosis on uh, the MRI should they have high chances of arrhythmogenic uh, events and death later How on. How are we so doing here? Get uh, ICD also. So no, the, what uh, I'm going to show basically is just some background of the alcohol septal ablation with the recent no, data and emerging know. indications uh, for alcohol septal ablation. Uh, so we know the background with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It is a dominant trait, occurs in 0.2% of cases, and uh, it's probably one of the single number one cause of sudden cardiac death in young athletes. Uh, and uh, so, so clearly what happened is this is the septal thickness, which is we call basal septal hypertrophy, which is more than 1.3 to 1 of the posterior asymmetrical septal hypertrophy, but many cases could be mid-ventricular hypertrophy. That's where it is a questionable whether it septal ablation works. We actually have published our series of the mid-cavity obstruction, those who are refractory to medical therapy versus basal septal, and we have similar outcome. Now of that, of that about two-third are the um, without obstruction, uh, which end about one-third with the obstruction uh, because of the ent- systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet. Uh, and uh, the, we know the myocardial changes. This is a patchy necrosis uh, in these patients and so. So key is, majority of these patients are asymptomatic. But some of them do develop symptoms of shortness of breath, fatigue, and of course rare cases could have sudden death and chest pain. So uh, what has shown uh, overall that uh, the outflow obstruction, so once you have obstruction versus no obstruction or young age or old age, the, one of the biggest factor is the obstruction. Once you have obstruction, obstruction is associated with higher or bad outcome at follow-up. So HOCM without obstruction, HOCM with obstruction, outflow gradient consider obstruction as more than 30 has almost uh, uh, the two to three times higher <coughs> odd ratio of subsequent death, even with the age uh, point of view. Uh, so now, this is the, we showed the classical Brockenborough brown wall morrow phenomena of the post-PVC potentiation, just putting a basic. So what is happening here with the HOCM, what happens in these patients? One, besides remaining asymptomatic, and uh, uh, that these patients, because of asymmetric septal hypertrophy of, as well as systolic enter motion, later on develop mitral regurgitation, AFib, pulmonary hypertension, low cardiac output, syncope, and sudden cardiac death, and heart failure. There are dial- cases of dilated uh, cardiomyopathy, precursors, which was preceded by hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, burnt out septum. So this is actually the latest algorithm which was submitted, which is, it looks very good. The patient with HOCM, symptoms of heart failure, none, then you do medical therapy and continue to follow those patients. And then, of course, if the patient uh, has uh, HOCM, w- what you need to do is both a genotic and phenotype testings and those who are high risk for ICD uh, based on the uh, MRI that they should go for primary uh, or secondary prevention of the ICD. ICD is life saving for appropriate patients with HOCM and there are whole criteria that who should get the, um, the pacemaker, uh, the ICD or not. Now patients who are symptomatic with the heart failure, what you do is you continue to follow them uh, with the that if just have mild symptoms, then you follow by exercise testings and uh, their day-to-day routine. And once they become, continue to remain asymptomatic, which is very good, reassure and continue medical therapy. So very interesting that even if you made the diagnosis, you found the gradient and patient does fine on medical therapy, which would usually constitute with a beta blocker, a calcium blocker or diisopyramide, you continue, do nothing to those patients. Just the gradient by itself without symptoms is not an indication to go forward. Now, those who continue to have symptoms, that's where you uplift your, you know, upscale your medical therapy and then consider surgical myomectomy or alcohol septal ablation for refractory symptoms on medical therapy. So very, very important point. Myomectomy or septal ablation is only done after refractory to medical therapy, and that is the guidelines, basically. Just by seeing uh, the case that you have a HOCM, you do not react to it. Yes, the appropriate patient should get ICD, even if they are asymptomatic. But 
going at the septal ablation uh, the therapies are used only in the patients who are symptomatic on medical therapy so very nice uh, uh, diagram so what does the alcohol septal does uh, decrease the obstruction symptoms and lvh and this is what's shown very nicely by decreasing the obstruction decreasing the mitral regurgitation increasing the left ventricular outflow tract and many of the uh, bad effect of uh, the hocm decreases because the decrease in the left ventricular and diastolic pressure, left, left atrial pressure, uh, so that you are less AFib, and then of course a decreased pulmonary pressure and symptoms improvement and prognosis for these patients. So one of the biggest criticism when this technique was started by, you know, originally in 1994 by Sigward, when he did his three cases, people thought that maybe now we have created MI, now these patients are going to die from arrhythmia. And that has been the, I would say, one of the rate limiting step in the adoption of the alcohol septal ablation in the day-to-day -day routine. People used to worry about that these patients may die because you have created now the new focus of arrhythmia in these arrhythmogenic setup of patient with the HOCM. So this actually has been refuted now with the long-term data, and I'll show you some of them. So basically what we've shown that uh, it has been shown that you decrease the alcohol septal and its uh, uh, gradient decreases and it persists. Uh, and uh, so, so more important is that you see the reduction in the septal thickness. It continues to reduce over time, which correspond to also reduction in the gradient. So whatever gradient you are left today after the procedure will continue to go down because of the septal thinning, uh, which takes place. Now, these are the methods which we have already spoken about. So we, this is just for somebody who is taking the notes today. It already comes handy, and I've written down all the steps, what we have done exactly today in this particular case. Then the, these are our steps which we in our uh, protocol uh, cath lab manual. So this is a little more details of the specifics of how to use the various approaches we have included in this uh, slide format. Now, what is the overall the safety and complication? In hospital mortality, it's less than 1% and uh, which has been shown subsequently uh, by many, many registries, data, and uh, similar to myomectomy. So in hospital mortality is similar. The question always has been, what about the long-term mortality because you have created the new focus of arrhythmia? Now, second is the pacemaker. Overall pacemaker rate, as we talked about, 10%, some studies more than 14%, and those who develop pacemaker are usually patients who have left bundle, or you have you injected fast, as well as two septals. So those are the very high odd ratio, as you can see there. So, uh, and females somehow develop more septal, the heart block after alcohol septal ablation compared to male. So left bundle, one of the important uh, predic the predictor of development of the complete heart block after septal ablation and so. Uh, and uh, the gradient uh, in decreases, but if you compare with the myomectomy, we don't have that much reduction in gradient. Myomectomy will obliterate the gradient, um, but compared to a alcohol septal ablation, you always have some residual, although we, I would say we have gotten better with that now. So there have been a many meta-analysis of the septal ablation with the, hyper with the myomectomy, knowing there is no randomized trial. No randomized trial, so one of the early uh, meta-analysis showed no difference in short or long-term survival, functional status, arrhythmia, repeat procedures or mitral regurgitation, but higher need for pacemaker and higher residual gradient after septal ablation. So therefore, choice of treatment strategy should be made after a thorough discussion of the procedure with the individual patient. Uh, so there are some papers with a long-term outcome showing exactly overlapping uh, after my, my, my myomectomy and as alcohol septal ablation up to 12-year follow-up. The second data from uh, Mayo Clinic by Nishimura and Sorja, survival after alcohol septal ablation for obstructive cardiomyopathy, again showing that myomectomy, ablation, or expected survival. Good treatment, good diagnosis is similar up to a 10 year uh, of follow up. Now, these are the few latest data came short and long term outcome of septal ablation in patients with a mild LVH. What about we just talked about that you have a, need a big, th thick septum, but what about your septum is 16 millimeter only? And then you can see here the outcome point of view, whether you have a small septum 16 or more than 16, uh, is overall seems to do quite well, except the, pace, the or some pacemaker implantation 
is higher in a lower septal thickness group. So your septum is 16 millimeter, 15 millimeter, your pacemaker rate is about one and a half times higher. Uh, other complications remains the same. And as you can see also need for the patients who have septal thickness of less than 16, higher rate of early post-procedure complications, but their long-term survival was better than for those septal thickness of more than 16. So you have lower septal thickness, you do a better compared to higher, except that you have a high chance of pacemaker in the short term uh, with this uh, study. And of course, uh, it's shown clearly that you have a higher, uh, thicker the septum, your repeat intervention is much higher uh, compared to a smaller one, and so. The, then, the, uh, basically showing that uh, the data which we just spoken, that uh, short term, uh, the small septal thickness, higher complication, long term does better. So now, there is another paper which comparing surgical myomectomy versus alcohol septal ablation, again from the last series uh, from Nishimura and Nguyen uh, from Mayo Clinic. Uh, the, they took the match cohort with a two to one matching, knowing that uh, the cohorts are totally different. Why? Myomectomy is done in the younger patient, septal ablation done in the older patient, so we were tough to match. But they were able to match a uh, 2 to 1 ratio of 334 myectomy with the 167 alcohol septal ablation. And this is the propensity match group on the right side with the 500 patients originated from 1500 of their database. They actually have the long-term follow-up and basically showing that in terms of the gradient uh, and the LVOT gradient remain residual. Uh, higher in the septal ablation group, which we all knew, more, but more important was that what happened to these patients at follow-up, post-procedural gradient, and so it seems to be that uh, what are the gradient which we have, it continued to, for the septal ablation group uh, for myomectomy, it really remains flat. So whatever you got, it remains flat, in, but uh, in the uh, um, alcohol septal ablation group, some increase in the gradient occurs at follow-up. But if you take the propensity score match analysis, survival of the propensity score match on the right side, myomectomy or sep alcohol septal ablation or expected survival is identical. So latest data that your good selected patient, if you match them, your outcome of the septal ablation is similar to a myomectomy. Uh, and this is basically, but re-intervention is much higher with the septal ablation compared to myomectomy, and many of them require either a myomectomy later after failed alcohol septal ablation or 8 to 10 percent re-injection of the septal artery. So therefore, authors concluded in this uh, the major their general of thoracic cardiovascular surgery that there are no differences in survival of patients undergoing myectomy or alcohol septal ablation, but freedom from reintervention and early and late reduction of left ventricle outflow tract gradients are superior in patients undergoing septal myomectomy compared to septal ablation. So now the question comes is that there are a lot of review articles. The latest one I just used, I put it here for a follow up uh, to update that overall outcome remains similar between two uh, strategies. And this is basically just to put another uh, decision tree that which case should get septal ablation, which should get myomectomy, and so on and so forth. It turns out to be that patients who are not, who have concomitant ventricular other disease, CAD, other valvular disease, should go for uh, surgery, and those are isolated cases, should go for alcohol septal ablation, particularly elderly patients. Now, the, uh, the latest study again from, uh, this is actually the large number of patients uh, from Germany uh, after alcohol septal ablation, 900 plus patients, as you see follow up uh, with the complications, uh, uh, particularly with the temporary heart block is much higher, but overall permanent pacemaker 10% and so seems to be that at follow up, myomectomy was done in 2%, re-alcohol septal ablation was done in 18% of cases and uh, complications shown there. So overall seems to be that it is that uh, the technique we are getting better, getting a good results and improving the overall short as well as long term outcome and so. So author concluded that in this study of percutaneous uh, transeptal uh, myomectomy, which is uh, alcohol ablation could be proved as a safe procedure with ongoing symptomatic improvement and excellent long-term survival. Therefore, PTCMA is a reasonable alternative to surgical myomectomy, myomectomy in HOCM patients. So this is basically uh, the data about younger patient versus older patient. Another publication on this field uh, showing that even the benefit uh, 
uh, of uh, the septal ablation is in a younger patients also. Uh, so although uh, traditionally we do not do septal ablation in the younger patient, but seems to be benefit remains even in the younger patient, and they actually recommended, authors suggested that maybe the guidelines should change or broaden to include younger patients for alcohol septal ablation. So just to sum up uh, that overall what do you do? Um, the patients, you decide who should go for septal ablation, who should go for myomectomy, and after failure of uh, medical intervention, overall, you, the uh, results remain identical. And this is where uh, the data showing that the pacemaker rate, actually, you see here, uh, as well as the length of stay, uh, other complications, kind of identical in selected patients with the myomectomy and alcohol septal ablation. Uh, and only thing remain is the, uh, the follow-up gradient. The follow-up gradient remain higher as well as repeat intervention higher with a septal ablation with this latest publication uh, of uh, this, uh, the, the, the treatment comparing both alcohol septal ablation as well as myomectomy. So, uh, so guideline-based referral, so basically uh, they stated that guideline-based referral for septal ablation and septal myomectomy leads to excellent outcomes with low procedural mortality, excellent long-term survival, and improvement in symptoms. These outcomes occur in alcohol septal ablation patients despite being an older cohort and significantly more comorbid conditions. So this is basically the guideline. As you see, the class one indication is after medical therapy, uh, refractory, and then others, uh, uh, septal ablation, and so comes only as a 2A and 2B indications. So where do you use alcohol septal ablation? Adults with elderly, elderly patients, septal bulge, right bundle branch block, previous cardiac surgery, expert interventional team. Myomectomy in children, adolescent, mitral valve intervention, patient has severe MR. Is a good indication for myomectomy, they'll repair the valve. Left bundle branch block, low operative risk, and expert surgical team. And this is a, a Sorja also put the similar thing in a pro and con of both surgical myomectomy and alcohol septal ablation, uh, just to put together what we have discussed today uh, in uh, selecting these, uh, the strategy uh, and so. So now, the just to briefly quick two points. One is a newer technique for septal ablation. One, you can do coil embolization. People used to do glue, but nobody uses that now. Radio frequency ablation, cryoablation of the septal, or you can cover the stent. You don't want to use alcohol, put a covered stent across the septum in the LED. Then people actually have done that just use a mitral clip in patient with only modest of septal hypertrophy. Uh, AK, isn't that one case we used a mitral clip for that patient? Yeah. Yeah, what was that case? Yeah. Increase yeah. my volume. We have done two cases so far, but the presentation was uh, different. Means patient presented with the, uh, um, you know, flail leaflet, but more important, severe MR. And septal hypertrophy with the septal uh, thickness was, like you mentioned, not a lot. With the gradient we had baseline with provocable was only about 30. So that's when we decided let's do the, uh, clip first. So we did the clip and we are still, I'm still following the uh, patient as you know, you know, symptom improvement and we're just monitoring the, um, you know, septal bulge. That's it. No change in the gradient and if, uh, since patient is feeling much better, we're not even planning to bring back for the septal ablation. So therefore, mitral clip is coming out in the equation of HOCM management with a moderate to severe MR. You, you have the bulge, you have the obstruction, but ignore it. Just put the clip in selected cases again. Uh, this, these are rare cases, but this is what we in the literature uh, quite a bit. Now, second, which is a real emergent indication of alcohol septal ablation is during tower or TMVR. That is to reduce the LVOT obstruction following this procedure. So this is actually the first one uh, when uh, came from uh, our Cleveland clinic. Uh, basically, the patient uh, after tower developed acute uh, the hemodynamic uh, compromise because of septal uh, causing the um, HOCM with obstruction. And they did an acute septal perforator uh, alcohol injection with a significant reduction in the hemodynamic gradient and improvement in patient condition. Since then, many papers have published this uh, uh, using the, AOT, the um, uh, alcohol septal ablation uh, before tower. This was the emergent case. We actually, our paper just accepted in, uh, in JAK intervention 
that AS with severe asymmetric septal hypertrophy from our group uh, uh, patients and we actually showed that these 10 patients where we did electively, we didn't do emergently, but electively the patients who have septal bulge so that the valve doesn't embolize and you get a good outcome, you do a septal ablation. We, we had done one case, one or two cases at the same time, but majority of them one or two months preceding the tower do the septal ablation and have a good outcome of these patients as shown in this, our publication which will be coming out, which has been accepted uh, and is in press. The second is the patients who got TMVR. So basically what happened is TMVR, the new LVOT gets obstructed by the valve the position of the valve it is and particularly the leaflet protrudes into the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction causing his serious hemodynamic compromise or even death in early patients with the TMVR. The first one, Myra Guerrero from at that time, uh, she was at uh, in, uh, in Chicago, now actually as Mayo Clinic, initially showed this data that show that yes, appropriate cases, maybe you do a septal ablation first before doing the TMVR and uh, they showed the hemodynamic uh, very positive response of these patients. So this led to the registry, uh, basically they actually uh, concluded the percutaneous alcohol ablation provides acute relief of TMVR induced LVOT obstruction with septal hypertrophy in a country which is a contributing factor. This may be a safer alternative to bail out surgery in this extremely high risk patient. So since then, now there is a first in man registry of the elective patients who are getting the alcohol septal ablation after the CT analysis to prevent LVOT obstruction for TMVR. So they go with a clear cut uh, because purpose is, but if you do take that hypertrophy septum, your LVOT increases because clearly the new LVOT, if decreases by 250 uh, millimeter or square or so, is associated with a bad outcome. So what has shown that yes, you can really measure it what will be your new LVOT and what will be after the septal uh, obstruction. And this actually shown here that the septal ablation that it improves after the alcohol septal ablation. So that's change in new LVOT uh, after TMVR is very, very reassuring. And these 30 patients had no event uh, after TMVR. So just to say this is a new emerging indication of now, as you know, another procedure is the lampoon procedure that you split the mitral leaflet to prevent the LVOT obstruction. Uh, so this is the first man, preemptive alcohol septal ablation is associated with a significant increase in predicted new LVOT area before TMVR and may enable safe TMVR in patients usually excluded secondary to prohibitive risk of LVOT obstruction. So another improvement in the field. So basically uh, cyanide data, we actually, as I mentioned, we started the program uh, Dr. Spencer came actually here, William Spencer, uh, back in 2001. We had done 254 cases. This is the distribution of the resting gradient, provocable gradient, post gradient. And we, as I mentioned, we lost one patient. Pacemaker rate is about 10%. Average length of stay is three. But more importantly, five year need for re intervention is about four. 5%. No patient has gone for uh, the myomectomy in our group because these are all high risk uh, patients which have been turned down by surgeons. So this is actually the nice uh, final diagram of uh, which puts everything together about alcohol septal ablation, need for AICD, alcohol, your myomectomy, and so, so nice, uh, I would say central figure, which is the central figure. Now, uh, only one the, comment of the central figure, the yeah. septal artery does not go up. It has to face <laughs> yeah. down into the septum. Yeah, so we will tell the author. Yeah. But no, it Please. is facing down. If you are in the no. ventricle, remember, <laughs> it is going inside. No, yeah. it's uh, going inside the septum. Yeah. Yeah. Down. So, but okay. So now I think uh, just to sum up few of the point, uh, our choice at Mount Sinai, that you asked earlier, uh, these are what we learned that length of stay definitely lower, pacemaker rate, procedure mortality, uh, available follow-up years and septal thickness, and key is the comorbid conditions and no significant MR, septal ablation, myomectomy, young patients, no comorbid condition, additional valve disease and CAD. So just to sum up, the septal reduction therapy of surgical myomectomy and or alcohol septal ablation are viable option in symptomatic HOCM patients and should be tried only in drug refractory patients. Numerous meta-analyses have shown similar MACE-free uh, outcomes after both therapies at 10 to 12 years, except the re-intervention higher in the septal uh, ablation group. And the alcohol septal ablation is also emerging as an 
adjunct tool to improve outcomes after tower and especially in many cases of TMVR by reducing the LVOT obstruction, it is being routinely incorporated in TMVR and TAVR procedure planning, which is what we are doing at present. So questions, three questions quickly. Following statements are true regarding surgical myomectomy versus alcohol septal ablation for HOCM except similar survival with myomectomy versus S alcohol septal ablation on short term or long term or high residual gradient after myomectomy versus septal ablation and high need for pacemaker with septal ablation versus myomectomy. We all know that gradient is lower with myomectomy compared to septal ablation. Second question, based on the available data, alcohol septal ablation for HOCM will be preferred in following subset of HOCM patient. Which one is the ideal case? 70 year old male with 50 millimeter gradient and 60% LED lesion. 40-year-old male with 50 millimeter gradient and 80% left main, 70-year-old male with 50 millimeter LVOT gradient and 4 plus MR, and 40-year-old male with 50 millimeter LVOT gradient and left bundle branch block. Clearly, that this will be the case number one, A will be the ideal patient for septal ablation in this uh, so data. So following technique of alcohol injection, during alcohol septal ablation for HOCM is associated with higher incidence or need for permanent pacemaker, slow injection, as uh, uh, Dr. Keeney pointed out, rapid bolus of 2 cc of alcohol, intermittent infusion of 4 cc of alcohol, and alcohol infusion technique has not shown to correlate with permanent pacemaker need. So actually, there are few papers which have shown when we used to give rapid bolus in the past was associated with a high uh, need for permanent pacemaker. With that note, I conclude our didactic portion of today's presentation. Well, I think it's been a fantastic experience today for the audience, for the cath lab uh, group. We did a basically a perfect example of the how to do this procedure. And we, Dr. Sharma, emphatically review the literature, the old literature, the present and the future literature. So um, thank you for the hard teams, members, and the cath lab. And thank you for joining us today for this exciting case. The recording of this case will be archived at www.cccliveCases.org later today. Structural heart life cases occur every other month on Tuesday. And so the next will be on Tuesday, September the 10th at 9 a.m. Before closing, I want to ask Dr. Sharma or Dr. Kinney if they have to say anything else. Well, all has been a very good uh, illustration of the technique and appropriate patient today. Yes. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Thank Sharma. You. Wonderful day. Bye.